For some 15 years, a Japanese PC maker dominated the Japanese PC market. Introduced by NEC in the early 1980s, the PC-98 standard monopolized the land of the rising sun. As late as 1991, PC-98 had nearly 60% market share between NEC and its clone manufacturers. They offered over 11,000 third-party software applications. Then in just five years, Wintel tore apart NEC and their vaunted monopoly. In this video, we're going to look at how Microsoft and Intel steamrolled a Japanese PC juggernaut. But first, I want to remind you about the newsletter. Sign up for updates and new analysis, the full write-ups for videos you might not have seen before, and more. The sign-up link is in the video description below. I try to put one out every week, maybe two. All right, back to the show. In the early 1970s, Intel, Motorola, and Zilog invented and introduced the first microprocessors. These were powerful enough for Japanese hobbyists to produce working desktop computers with them. Since most people still associated computers with big room-sized mainframes, these hobbyist gadgets were called microcomputers. Takayoshi Shina used to work at DEC, the mini computer company. Then just 26 years old, he left in 1970 to start a company called Sword writing software for imported computers before eventually producing their own. Starting in 1974, SWORD releases a series of kit-based microcomputers, some of Japan's first ever, on Intel and Zilog 8-bit microprocessors. Like the hobbyist 8-bit computers in America, these ran basic software. Early American microcomputer makers largely stayed out of the Japan market at first. This was in large part due to the challenge of translating and supporting all the characters in East Asian languages like Japanese. These imposed fundamental new requirements on the whole system. Each kanji character requires about two bytes to display, twice as much as English characters, which were about one byte. Furthermore, Japanese PCs had to input, store, and display so many more characters than European ones, 6,000 as opposed to 200. Not to mention all the peripherals and the software. Think keyboards, printers, applications, all of it. Adapting all of this to handle Japanese characters was daunting. And the Americans were too busy battling it out for their own microcomputer market anyway, estimated to be about four times larger than Japan's. This left the early Japanese PC market free for domestic providers. At this time, the Japanese computer market was divided amongst three big vertically integrated natives and IBM. There were Fujitsu, Hitachi, and the Nippon Electric Company, or NEC. Together with IBM Japan, they had 85% share of the entire Japanese computer mainframe market. NEC, the weakest of the domestic Japanese computer makers, ended up being the one kicking off the Japanese PC revolution. Their integrated circuit division had signed a second source agreement with Intel for their 8080, resulting in the NEC UPD753 8-bit microprocessor. But their sales division was struggling to educate customers on this new category. This was, in part, due to the salespeople's own lack of understanding of the product. So a small sales team produced the TK80, an educational single-board computer kit, kind of like how the Apple One was. Unlike other microcomputer kits of its time, the TK80 did not require additional input or output like a terminal or a teletype. It had 8 LEDs for data output and a 20-key keyboard attached right onto the board. The IC division called it a doraku, or side hobby, to senior management. This was in part to keep it away from NEC's computer division, who at one point told the TK80 team to stop playing with fire. For such a crude product to come out under the prestigious NEC name would have caused issues. NEC's IC team expected to sell about 200 units of the TK80, priced at 88,500 yen each in total. But not only engineers, but business owners and hobbyists bought it, turning over 25,000 units two years after its 1976 release. To promote the TK80, NEC set up a support center called the Bit Inn in September 1976, in the seventh floor of a shop in Akihabara, the place soon became a mecca for Japanese computer enthusiasts. The other big Japanese computer makers quickly introduced their own microcomputer kits, like Hitachi's Basic Master L1 in 1978. That year, in 1978, about 9,143 microcomputer units were sold in Japan, 
Nearly half of that, 45%, were hobbyist kits. The NEC development team worked sales and support at the Bit Inn on the weekends. There, they quickly noticed that customers were trying to use the TK80 as a computer. For instance, a doctor asked if they could use the TK80 to record medical costs. A farmer asked if it can help them record sales slips for their rice field. Even an astronomer showed up asking if he can use it to calculate solar eclipses. The TK80 lacked the memory capacity and expandability to do these real computer things. NEC released a follow-up called the TK80BS, which had a full keyboard and ran a very lightweight version of BASIC, ergo the BS name, but it failed to sell. NEC's IC division eventually determined that they needed to start from square one. So in 1978, they embarked on producing a legit microcomputer, the PC8001, their Apple II-like hit. Unlike the TK80, the PC8001 microcomputer came fully assembled and sold for what is today about $4,168, relatively affordable. And it was powerful. Powered by a Zilog Z80 compatible 8-bit chip from NEC, the PC8001 was the first Japanese microcomputer with a colored display and sported a floppy disk drive for fast data read and write. It ran a flavor of the Microsoft Basic programming language called NBasic, later N88 Basic. Back then, Microsoft was a tiny company with just 10 people. People at NEC worried about relying on such a small venture, but Kazuya Watanabe, head of PC8001 development, insisted since Microsoft Basic was already so widely adopted in the American market. Releasing the PC8001 was a risk. By now, the IC division charade of selling a teaching tool no longer held up, and it was becoming increasingly clear that NEC was staking its name on what many in the company saw as an unreliable toy. The TK80BS's poor sales only made this division harder. Presented at the microcomputer show in Tokyo, sales began in September 1979. The product was an instant hit. No clue why anyone ever doubted it and NEC could not keep up with sales. It took half a year to ship out all the back orders. From 1980 to 1982, NEC held about 40 to 44% of the market. They eventually sold about 250,000 PC8001s, mostly through their retail computer network, NEC Microcomputer Shop. This widespread availability played a big role in their popularization. Same as with the rise of the Apple II and other desktop microcomputers over in the United States. IBM notices the burgeoning success of the hobbyist PCs like the Apple II. Realizing the threat they presented to the business, they initiate a guerrilla project to produce the IBM Personal Computer, or PC. To keep it away from the famous IBM bureaucracy, CEO Frank Carey puts the team in Boca Raton. In order to produce it quickly enough, the IBM PC team used a lot of off-the-shelf parts. The only IBM proprietary part in the PC is the middle layer BIOS. Critically, the microprocessor came from Intel and the operating system from Microsoft. The IBM PC is an immediate hit. Technically, it was a fine product. It offered a significant boost in processing power and capability from its leading edge 16-bit microprocessor. But the computer also vastly benefited from the cachet of the IBM name, as well as the giant's titanic marketing resources. This spread the IBM PC standard far and wide, establishing it across the entire industry. For all its popularity, though, the IBM PC still lacked the compute power to deal with the Japanese kanji language. So IBM sold a different computer, the PC5550, which despite the name was not compatible with PC software. This gave NEC the opportunity to build on their growing PC advantage. The huge success of both the PC8001 and the IBM PC opened NEC's eyes to the opportunity ahead of them. The NEC computer division, which previously disregarded the PC8001 as a mere toy, decided to go into PCs. They would be the ones to produce the next generation NEC 16-bit PC. The NEC IC division would be left with the 8-bit PC lines, that original PC8001 and its follow-up, the PC8801, and a thank you very much. Understandably, 
the NECIC division did not appreciate having their success taken away from them. So they went ahead and eventually produced the PC-100 in October 1983. The NEC PC-100 ran MS-DOS and had powerful graphical capabilities, but it cost too much and it was not compatible with prior software. NEC eventually had to shut it down. Anyways, in February 1982, the new NEC team started development for this new 16-bit PC. This PC was originally meant to be a smaller version of one of NEC's earlier mini-computers, but PC-8001 head of development Watanabe wanted this new PC to be backwards compatible with all the PC-8001 software. This forced NEC to reverse engineer the old NEC basic programming language used in the PC-8001 and PC-8801 to achieve this backwards compatibility. But it was worth it, as it now allowed customers to bring their software over with them, a crucial leverage point. Since NEC worked with Microsoft before, they reached out to Bill Gates and Microsoft, again, for a Japanese version of MS-DOS. But the guys in Redmond were apparently too busy with the US market to help here. So NEC acquired a copy of the software and modified it for improved support in displaying Japanese kanji with the help of some custom hardware. This final package was not all that different from MS-DOS, but the changes were significant enough to make it incompatible with MS-DOS software. In October 1982, a little over a year after the release of the IBM PC, NEC released the NEC PC 9801. It is of course a massive hit. The first year after the PC 9801's introduction, NEC had 80% of the 16-bit PC market. NEC was first in the 16-bit Japanese PC market, but it wasn't alone. Their biggest rival computer maker was Fujitsu. Fujitsu tended to produce technically superior products, but lagged in terms of strategy and execution. Their IC division also launched their own microcomputer kit, the L-Kit 8, but it came in 1977, or a year after NEC's. And the management never really followed up on that until the Fujitsu FM8 PC in May 1981. The FM8 was an 8-bit microcomputer, roughly equivalent to the already well-established PC8001. It lacked good third-party applications, and despite a superior graphics interface, it failed to sell well. Then in November 1982, Fujitsu released a new set of 8-bit PCs, the FM7 and its higher-end sibling, the FM11. They ran a Fujitsu-only flavor of BASIC that was not compatible with programs written for their own FM8 computer, then just a year old. This lack of compatibility was a reflection of the discord between Fujitsu's IC division and the rest of the company, like those experienced by NEC. Meanwhile, NEC built on their first mover advantages, outcompeting Fujitsu on distribution and third-party applications. NEC expanded their original bit-in enthusiast shop into a chain of retail outlets where NEC engineers can work directly with users on how to use their product. They were the first to do anything like this. Fujitsu failed to expand their own versions of this and fell increasingly behind as NEC recruited a network of sales outlets. By 1985, NEC had about 134 distribution outlets, while Fujitsu only had 80. NEC also managed to build a successful application library. From the very start, they had a strong third-party developer relations program, giving Japanese software houses access to documentation and free computers. By 1987, there were 10 times more third-party software available for the PC-98 than for a Fujitsu platform. This included the best-selling Japanese word processing software Ichitaro and the spreadsheet app Lotus123. Ichitaro was one of the key business productivity apps in the ecosystem. Users liked its unique module for converting kana syllables into kanji characters. Its producer, a small company called Just Software, grew to become Japan's third largest software house in 1994. Anyway, the end result was a near sweep of the 16-bit PC market by NEC. By 1983, two years after its release, the PC-98 standard, similar to but incompatible with IBM's, became the leader in Japan. Japan's other PC vendors tried to attack NEC's PC-98 dominance. Toshiba mounted a significant challenge in 1985 
when they introduced the first mass market laptop computer, the T1100. A year later, in October 1986, Toshiba released a version for the Japan market, the Dynabook J3100. It used an Intel 286 chip and ran a Japanese language version of MS DOS. This smaller portable form factor presented a serious challenge to the PC98 platform. However, Toshiba had already exited the desktop Japanese PC industry a few years earlier. The J3100 was an attempt to re-enter the market. So NEC had a chance to first bring a product to the market. And that same month, October 1986, NEC released the PC98 LT. It was a cool product, cheaper and lighter than its Toshiba competitor. However, it was not compatible with the PC98 desktop software and so did not sell well. For the first year, Toshiba's J3100 outsold the 98LT despite being far larger and heavier. NEC correctly intuited that users valued compatibility and processing over portability. And so in March 1988, they released the fully PC98 compatible PC9801 LV. Combined with the subsequent NEC PC9801N or 98 Note, Released in March 1990, the laptops helped NEC fend off Toshiba and retain its market dominance. If you can't beat them, join them, right? Seiko Epson had produced one of Japan's first PCs all the way back in 1977 with the Seiko 5700. Ten years later, they decided to joyride onto the NEC platform with a series of PC-98 laptop and desktop clones. NEC sued Seiko for copyright infringement, but the two firms eventually settled out of court. The clones cost slightly less than NEC's, which allowed them to grab some market share, which was okay because their money came more from printers. In 1991, they were the second largest PC maker with 8.5% of the Japan market, just barely ahead of Fujitsu. NEC led the market with 51% share. This means that the PC-98 standard held nearly 60% share of the Japanese market. Other major PC platforms at the time included those of Fujitsu, also with their own flavor of IBM-incompatible MS-DOS, IBM Japan and Toshiba, which produce Intel-based IBM-compatible PCs, and then we have the AX Consortium, an attempt by smaller PC firms like Sanyo, Oki, Casio, and Acer to dislodge NEC with a variant of the IBM PC AT standard called AX. It can handle Japanese characters, but could only do so with the help of additional special video chips. Thus, it cost more and did not have good application support. And Apple Japan, which was doing its own thing with the Macintosh and all. Smaller companies like Tomcat and ProSide tried to enter the PC-98 clone business alongside Epson. But since Epson and NEC settled out of court, the unresolved legalities of such a thing kept it from catching on. At the heart of it, NEC's PC-98 standard relied on three things as its moat. First was a specialized support of Japanese language. Second was a strong distribution and sales network. And third was a strong library of third-party application software. By 1993, NEC had some 17,000 software packages for users, the largest in the country. NEC eventually got to be a bit complacent. While they made some moves to go global, they continued to harvest profits from their protected monopoly. In 1991, PCs made up just 18% of the company's revenues, but contributed 40% of their profits. At the same time, it was becoming increasingly clear that the Japanese PC market had technologically isolated itself from that of the rest of the worlds. PC adoption in Japan lagged the United States, with just 8.7 PCs per 100 people in 1994 as compared to America's 28.4. This was in part due to NEC's higher prices. Two major developments changed the game for NEC and signaled the beginning of its decline. First, Intel finally came up with microprocessors powerful enough to enable PCs to handle Japanese kanji. The first was the Intel 386, which entered Japan in 1987, and then the Intel 486 in 1990. NEC had their own line of x86 compatible chips called the V-Series. Intel sued them for it, but lost. People expected NEC to bring these chips worldwide, 
but they never caught on, probably since Intel still so tightly controlled the x86 standard. Even NEC's PCs dropped them by 1993. Second, IBM Japan developed a new version of their Japanese language MS-DOS called DOS 5. It was an IBM-compatible software solution capable of handling the Japanese language with just a standard VGA adapter. IBM Japan first pre-announced DOS 5 in October 1990 and allowed other companies to license it, forming a consortium called the PC Open Architecture Developers Group to manage it. It shipped about a year later. Second-tier PC makers like Canon, Mitsubishi Electric, and Sanyo immediately signed on to providing systems using the DOS 5 OS. They had nothing to lose. There were 23 providers on board by the end of 1991. Most critically, DOS 5 was a pure software package. This suddenly allowed the foreign Wintel companies like Compaq to port their Intel and Microsoft-based products into Japanese without complicated hardware modifications a bridge thrown over NEC's moat into the Japanese market. NEC argued that their hardware modifications made their Japanese language support superior to that of the DOS 5 group, but IBM Japan retorted, correctly, that more powerful graphics cards and Intel processors would obviate that advantage. In October 1992, Compaq smashed into the Japanese PC market like Moby Dick into the Pequod. They released a DOS 5 computer price at about 128,000 yen, near American prices, but half the price of NEC's cheapest PC-98 computer model in Japan. Dell followed a few months later in January 1993 with their own PC, running massive direct marketing campaigns to circumvent NEC's distribution networks. Compaq ultimately never made real progress into the Japanese market, but their Compaq Shock, as it was called at the time, kicked off a price war, triggering a massive upswell in the Japanese PC market which expanded some 50% from 1992 to 1994. Despite having to cut prices, NEC and PC-98 continued to hold significant market share at the cost of profits. This was in part due to DOS 5's deficiencies in software packages. PC-98's library was still nearly three times the size of DOS 5's 5,000 packages. Then less than a year later, Microsoft released a Japanese version of Windows 3.1, Windows 3.1J into the market. Windows 3.1J's attractive graphical user interface was a massive hit in Japan and it sold 1.46 million copies in its first year in the market. Critically, Microsoft made it so that all Windows compatible applications would also work on DOS based operating systems. This means not only DOS 5's computers, but also NEC's PC-98 and Fujitsu's FMR systems. This allowed competitors to successfully argue that the PC-98 standard had no more special advantage and that going Windows was the best way forward. Now Japan's larger computer makers, not just as runner-ups, started defecting to Wintel or DOS 5 computers. Toshiba and Hitachi joined in May 1993 right soon after the Windows 3.1J release. It heralded the beginning of the end for NEC and their proprietary PC-98. Fujitsu, NEC's biggest rival, joined a few months later in October with its FMV line of computers. Even Epson, NEC's clone partner in arms, switched over. Then in 1995, Fujitsu kicked off a price war of their own. Suffering the collapse of their core mainframe market, they cut the price of their PCs below even those of the imports. They were literally losing something like $200 to $500 on every PC sold. In the past, PC98's powerful software library would have made price cuts like these fruitless. Why bother buying a cheap PC if you can't do anything with it? But things have changed. Fujitsu's PCs were Wintel machines with full access to the growing Windows application library. And this time, Fujitsu's price cuts drew blood. Fujitsu sold nearly a million PCs in 1995, doubling their market share to 17.5%. In just four years, NEC's market share had been sledgehammered from 51% to 41.2%. And now suddenly, their share started crashing. In 1996, they lost another 8 points to fall to 33% market share. Fujitsu raised theirs to 22%. NEC was doing all it can to keep up with the hardware price wars. They outsourced more PC manufacturing to Taiwan, moved PC design to Hong Kong, 
and bought the struggling low-cost manufacturer Packard Bell. But in the end, they could not compete with the Windows Tide, especially with the super popular Windows 95 OS now entering the market. NEC did hardware, not software. They had no idea how to adapt and graft a graphical user interface like the one on Windows 95 onto their aging PC-98 standard. Thus, in 1997, they decided to move on. March 1997, they started selling DOS 5 machines themselves. In October 1997, they revealed the PC-98NX, phasing out the PC-98 architecture. Japan spent nearly a decade and a half on a geographical island, software-wise, and it had long-lasting consequences. For one thing, much of Japan's software is customized for the particular customer, so a lot of time and money had to be invested in order to convert that PC-98 stuff to a Windows-compatible format. Second, it made it harder for Japanese software companies to go abroad and export their products. The PC-98 market was not big, or profitable enough to allow the Japanese software houses to go international. This has lasting effects on Japan's software industry to this day. I do wonder if NEC missed an opportunity to go down the GUI pathway and build their own standard. The reasons why they didn't are obvious and they probably did the right thing, but I would have loved to see them try. The PC-98 standard still lives on thanks to emulators used to play the many video games developed for it. And I do believe a lot of nostalgia remains for those long gone days. All right, everyone, that's it for tonight. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to the channel, sign up for the newsletter, and I'll see you guys next time.